So is it well with your soul? Is it well with your soul? That's a very good question. Here we are in the season of a new year, and uh, anything's got to be better than the last year, right? So it should be well with your soul, at least in some capacity. We've been looking at greater things to be done in 2021, and we're taking this from the Lord Jesus Christ when he told the disciples, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And so we looked at the first week of, the, of January at how the greater things that Jesus was referring to were the things that the church will do, that the church will do. And in the book of Acts, we found that there are certain things that the church did greater. And the first one we noticed was outreach. The church grew on the day of Pentecost, its very first day, the day it was conceived and born in Acts chapter 2. It grew by 3,000 people in one day, more than all that had followed Jesus during the whole time of his three-year ministry. Greater things were already begun. This is what Jesus said. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. It is my hope that in 2021, we will be greater witnesses. That means we have to live it, and then we have to tell it. In fact, we're supposed to so live our lives that people are provoked to ask us the reason of hope that lies within us so that we can share our faith. Just living it is not enough. You have to also tell it. But if you tell it and you haven't lived it, nobody's going to believe it. So you have to live it and then tell it so that they believe it, that they believe it. Greater outreach is my goal for 2021. The next thing we notice in the passage in Acts chapter 2 is that during the greater events that were going on, there was greater devotion. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. They had a greater devotion. They were all in, all in. And one of the ways we talked about being all in is the word devotion. One of it means is that you joined up and that we need to see in our church more who say, you know what, I'm going to join up. I'm going to become a member. I'm going to become a part of Bethany Church and what it is doing. Because it's here at the church that we teach. Now, Having said that, we are trying to resume all of our Bible studies and regular activities, and the men are going to resume their Band of Brothers Bible study. The series is called Not a Fan. You know what a fan is? A fan is a person who sits in the stands, and they watch the game go on. It's kind of like the person who says, I sit in the pew, and I watch what he's got to say. But not a fan says, I'm not going to be in the pew. I'm not going to be in the stands. I'm going to get in the game. And that's what we're going to be studying. Getting in the game of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. It's really a cool kind of series because it's more in a movie fashion. It's going to follow the life of Matthew. And uh, it's going to do it in a contemporary way. And then we'll have our time of discussion after it. Now the ladies are having their women's Bible study. And it's going to be on the chosen Jesus chose his disciples. I believe that you who are here and those who are watching, you are the chosen. You're chosen. You were chosen to be here today. You're chosen. And Jesus wants to minister into your life, and you're going to have that Bible study opportunity to do so. Now, there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby uh, for the group, the chosen. And so we want you to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching. The next thing we looked at, and that was last week, the greater experience. There was something going on in the early church that hadn't happened before. The apostles were fully empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they began preaching, and somehow miraculously, their preaching was changed in the air so everyone who was there heard it in their own language. And so they were all 
filled with awe. They said, whoa, what is this? It was an awe-inspiring experience that what they were seeing that was happening, that they knew that this was from God, and they were in awe. And part of my desire is not only to have greater outreach, greater devotion, but to have a greater experience where you stand in awe of what God is doing in the time in which we live through the Holy Spirit using us as a church to minister into people's lives. Now, that's what we've covered already. And today, I want to look at greater worship. The early church had greater worship. It says, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God. I like the expression, praising God. I don't know what you think of when you think of praise. Some people think of singing. Some people think of of, uh, getting up and testifying. The the word praise, this is my own own definition. So if you look this up in the dictionary, you're not going to find it listed there. I call it bragging about God. Bragging about God. When you praise yourself, you're bragging about yourself. You're a boaster. But when you focus your you're bragging on God. And you give God credit for something in your life. That is praise. You're giving all worth, honor, glory to him. That, that's worship. That's worship. There was greater worship at this time. And they were all enjoying favor with all the people. Now I want to notice the first thing about this. There was a time for worship. Every day, they continue to meet together. You say, whoa, every day? Every day. Every day they had a service. They got together, and, and, and they, they worshiped the Lord. Now, as time went on, the, the people went back to their normal lives because they had been gathered for the feast. But as time went on, they, they went back home, and they began worshiping on one day of the week. Now, the, the, the congregation at the very beginning was Jewish. And so the day that the Jews met for worship was on our Saturday or their Sabbath day. And they, they met on that Sabbath day because God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, back in Genesis, the very first chapters. And the reason for that was, in six days, God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day... He rested. And so the command was that you were to rest from all of your labors, all of your work on the seventh day, which is our Saturday. It was the Sabbath day, and that's when they were to rest. And so worship, typically in the temple, went on on Saturday. But something happened over time. Once the church began, the day was shifted from Saturday to Sunday. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, verse 2, it tells us that they gathered together on the first day of the week. And the reason they gathered on the first day of the week was because they were no longer focusing on the creation, but they were focusing on the resurrection. The resurrection. Every Sunday when we come to to worship, we are testifying to the Jewish community that their Messiah, Jesus, was crucified and rose from the dead, and we were worshiping Jesus, who is a risen Savior. It has moved from Saturday to Sunday. In the Revelation, it is called the Lord's Day. Today is the Lord's Day. Nearly every service that we have at church here, I will end it by saying, and have a wonderful Lord's Day. Because this is the Lord's day. It's the first day of the week. It's when we worship Jesus Christ, who is God, come in the flesh, who went to the cross, he, was, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. We are worshiping Jesus Christ. Every day they met. And then they moved to once a week. Once a week. And that's the pattern we follow even to this day. To this day. 
They had a designated time of worship. They also had a designated place of worship. They had a place of worship. It said every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I believe they were actually meeting in the court of the Gentiles. I've kind of highlighted it there in yellow so you know. It could handle the congregation of the 3,000. And they would gather there, but they, they would meet in that place. And they were meeting because Jesus said, the angels actually said, that Jesus that has gone into heaven is going to come back. And so they're expecting him to come back immediately. So every day they're going there, they're worshiping, and they're worshiping Jesus. They're meeting in the temple courts. Temple courts. They had no church buildings. The church was not the building. The church was not the temple. The church was the people. We call this building a church. And the only reason we call this building a church is because the people, the church, meet here for worship. But if we met in the school, we would still be the church. The school building would be the church. If you met in a basement, in a cellar, in a catacomb, that would be the church because that's where the people met for church. They were meeting together. I, I find this very important. They got together for worship. You can worship alone, but the early church did not just worship alone. They gathered together. They gathered together. It is so important. Right now, we uh, are still in a pandemic and a lot of people do not want to get together for fear. And those of you who are watching online, some of you say, you know, I can't. My age or my, my uh, health conditions will not permit it. But you need to log in and you need to, to be a part of the worship. I think some people, over time, have just gotten lazy in their commitment of getting together, either online or going to the church building, but that's not what fully devoted Christians do. Fully devoted Christians go to church. They meet for worship. My wife and I, when we go on vacation, we always go to church. Always go to church. Last summer, we were up north in the Upper Peninsula, and uh, we were looking for a church to go to on the Saturday night, and a all of things that we noticed, there was a Bethany Baptist Church. So we decided that's where we were going. And they were all social, practicing social distancing, and there was a lot of young families. They had no children's program, so all the kids were sitting in the, in, in the pews with us. The guy got up and he preached, and, and he was an expositor, and he was, he was going through the Word of God, and, and, and it was uh, everybody in the congregation had their Bibles, and they were all taking notes. And, and it, wow, this, this was great. He preached, and then we posted online, hey, we went to this church. I could not believe how many people were aware of that church up there. And one of them, one of my friends said, I grew up in that church. My dad pastored that church for like 40 years. And, so, and to us, it was just mere coincidence. We have been to all kinds of churches. Uh, we, when we were in Boston, we went to the church where uh, they hung the lantern. You know, you know, one by land, two by sea. When we were in California, uh, we went to the Glass Cathedral. When we were in the south, we went to the First Baptist Church of Atlanta for church. We got up, we made our way there, and we sat about four or five rows back to watch Charles Stanley preach that Sunday. You know what? Just because you go on vacation does not mean you vacate from God and worshiping him. Whatever it takes. The strangest experience ever was I'd taken my family all the way out to California and we stopped in St. George, Utah. And I looked up in the phone book, because back in that day we didn't have cell phones, all that, we didn't have internet. And I looked up for a, a church. There must have been 10, 12 pages of Mormon churches. I found two Baptist churches. And so when I found those two Baptist churches, I picked the one that I thought was the closest. The morning we got up, we drove over to that, that, that church, but it wasn't there. <laughs> and so he said, oh, well, maybe God really doesn't want us to go to church today. Isn't that the way you think? <laughs> I put all this effort into it, 
get there? And, and, and so what happened? We, we went on down the road, and here there's a storefront church. We pull into that storefront church. There's only a handful of people, less than what we have here today. But we do remember this. We sat in a row, and the family in front of us that filed in had two little twin daughters. And they must have been about six years old, seven years old. They turned around, put their head on the back of the chair, and stared at us like <laughs> fresh meat. <laughs> they stared at us. The guy got up, and he preached the sermon. Now, I heard Chuck Swindoll, John MacArthur. I've been to the Glass Cathedral. I heard all these guys preaching. I'd been to a conference. Every day, morning and evening, big gun preachers are preaching. I can't tell you what one of those preachers preached on. But that guy got up and he preached. He preached on 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. He preached on that. That so touched me, I went back home and God just kept putting it on my heart. I wound up preaching through the Chronicles. I called it Living Like a King. And I went through the lives of the kings. And why? I didn't miss worship. And the worship service I was about to miss was the one that God spoke to me the most. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? They were meeting together in the temple courts every single day. They were communing. Communion is part of worship. Every single day, they broke the bread. Now notice it says, in their homes. In their homes. If you've got 3,000 people in the, te in the temple, and you're going to have the Lord's Supper, you're going to break the bread, you're going to have the, you know, the, the cup uh, of the new covenant, and, and you're going to do that, you've got to make preparation for all that. But what happened was, the church broke up into small groups, and they were meeting in people's homes. And there's this thing called the home church. Some of the largest churches in the world, okay, they don't have a building. They meet in homes as home churches. That's what they were doing. They would meet in the homes, and they would break the bread and celebrate the Lord's Supper. They, they would remember that Jesus died in their place. This is my body, which is broken for you. They would remember that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of their sins and the ratifying of the new covenant. And they would do that together. Communion is part of worship. And that's why we do it. The Bible says, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. So it says it's often. It doesn't tell us how often. They were doing it every day. Some churches do it every week. Some, some churches do it once a month. Oh, that's us. We don't want to do it so often that it becomes meaningless and just a ritual. But we want to do it frequently enough that we are constantly reminded that Jesus Christ died for our sins and our salvation is linked totally back to him. It's part of our worship. The next thing I noticed in the text, it says, and they ate together. They ate together. This has been so difficult. We used to have monthly fellowship dinners here. Monthly. They ate together. Ate together. There's something about eating together because there's more that goes on than just refreshing your body. There is sharing and talking. And I've noticed that as the American family stopped having dinner together in the evening. They don't. They sit around a TV or whatever. They don't, they don't sit together and just eat their meal. They don't talk. They don't reflect on their day. And the American family has been dying. It's been dissolving. It's been breaking up. It's foundational. They ate together. It's crucial. Fellowship is crucial to our church. COVID-19 has done more to devastate the church by stopping us from worship. We did so for six weeks. By stopping our fellowship. So listen, you can still fellowship together around a meal. You said, but wait a minute, how do we do that? All right, I'll tell you how. 
When COVID-19 hit and we were on lockdown, my niece set up a Zoom meeting and every Tuesday night, it was called Taco Tuesday night, every Taco Tuesday night we all Zoomed together and we ate together our meals. We were in Michigan, we were in Florida, we were in uh, South, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, we were in North Carolina, uh, we were in uh, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Ohio, and we all had our, had our Zoom meeting going on, and we were all sharing what we were eating, and then we were telling tall tales and stories. We were connected as a family. And those of you who are online watching, you can still fellowship. It might take a little organization on your part. You call a few other of our members who are not fellowshipping at the moment here physically, and you call them and say, hey, let's have a Zoom dinner, a Taco Tuesday. And, and you log in, you share your meal together, you eat together, and you share. In two weeks, our governor is opening up restaurants for indoor dining. You can still do as you used to do, get together with a pocket of friends and go somewhere and fellowship. You see, fellowship extended the worship experience. The people around those meals, I, I don't know what they're talking about. It's not recorded. But i got to imagine saying, hey, did you get that, what Peter said today? Come on. Peter said, you got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. I don't have to keep the law. They were disgusting. It extends the worship experience. Fellowship. The fellowship is part of worship. It extends it. The next one is, it says that they did so with sincerity of worship. It says they were glad they were in the home celebrating the Lord's Supper and having this meal. That meal was also later called an agape meal, an agape, I mean, a love meal. I find that in the book of Jude, love meal. And it says with glad and sincere hearts. Now, the word glad, I looked this up, means extremely joyful. Extremely joyful. And sincere is just simple, very simple. That's a word, it means simple. I wonder, maybe so many Christians have no extreme joy because they are not worshiping like it's laid out in the book of Acts. Worship is more focused on me than it is on the Lord. I didn't like the song they sang today. I wish they'd sing the song and then you name the one you want. Why? What? It's about you? What you like? Worship is about what you like? No, no, no. Worship is about you, Lord. It's about you. Boy, I was really upset today. I was freezing over in the corner. I, they should turn the heat up. Somebody else saying, oh my goodness, I don't know if i go back. It was too hot today. I wish they would bring the temperature down in the building. You getting the picture? We are robbing ourselves of our extreme joyful experience when we take our focus off the Lord and focus on all the stuff around us and all the people around us and I'm part of the selfie. It's all about me. All about me. They had extreme joy and simple hearts. Simple. Some people say, well, you know, my life is just so complicated. It wasn't complicated for them. If your life is so complicated, maybe you should uncomplicate it. Find out what it is that is so complicating your life that you can't focus on the Lord and make sure he is the priority in your life. They had sincere worship. It, they were fully devoted, sincerely and, and given over to the Lord in their worship. They had a focus of worship. They were praising God. So, in, in the book, The Purpose Driven Life, the very first paragraph is just one, one sentence, and it says this. It's not about you. I can remember when I first read that, I said, whoa. 
That's it in a nutshell. It's not about me. They were praising God. They, they had their focus in the right direction. They were so focused on God that they had sincerity. They, they had all these things that was going on. They were genuine fellowship. Uh, they had genuine worship. They had extreme joy because the focus was in the right place. And it goes on and it says, there was a joy in worship. They enjoyed it. Because they enjoyed it, they didn't want to miss it. And so that they were there, it, it was a joy. It said they were enjoying the favor of all the people. You know, I looked up this in the Greek New Testament, and the word for favor is actually the word grace. Grace. Uh, Dave Ramsey and his uh, Financial Peace University is broadcast on the radio. People will call in and they'll say, uh, and he'll say, how you doing to him? Dave, how you doing? And he always answers with this line, better than I deserve. I love that. Better than I deserve. That's grace. Grace is when God gave me better than I deserved. He gave me salvation. I didn't deserve that. He gave me a son, Jesus. I didn't deserve that. Better than I deserve. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. This text is saying they were enjoying the better than I deserve from all the people. Everybody in the congregation was treating other people better than they deserved. Wow. That's not the way it works today. We live in a prejudicial world. Uh, we live in a divided world. Uh, it's us against them. It's uh, Democrat versus Republican or Republican versus Democrat. And, uh, and no, I, I, I'm not going to treat them. They're, they're not worthy of, of, of my respect. They're not worthy of my time. They're not. Wait a minute. In the early church, the body of Christ, the person that was the least, they, they, they treated them better than they deserved. A little later in the story of the book of Acts. There's going to be this guy by the name of Saul. And he's out persecuting and rounding up Christians. He's incarcerating them. He, he's, trying to, he's trying to snuff out the Christian faith. And a guy by the name of Barnabas, son of uh, Consolation, this guy, he comes along and he says, he's, he's been converted. He's our brother. And he starts treating him better than he deserved. He embraces him. He takes him into the church. The church is afraid of him. People are saying, I'm not going to church. Paul says, this guy Saul's there. He, he's out. It's a trick. He didn't really get converted. He's out to get us. And Barnabas treats him better than he deserves. Better than he deserves. Can you imagine what Bethany would be like? if every single person in our church treated everyone else better than they deserved. We would be that place that Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. They will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. I think this is one of the most loving churches I've ever been involved in. But that does not mean we can't improve. Loving, treating other people better than they deserve. So what was missing in this worship? Did you notice anything that's missing? How about singing? Did you notice singing wasn't... And in our modern church, when you talk about the worship service, people immediately think of singing. They think that singing is worship. Preaching, you know, isn't part of worship. No, but preaching was. Teaching was, fellowshipping was, all these things listed in this. But then I asked the question, what was missing singing? Uh, oh, really? I don't think so. I said they continued to meet together, praising God. That word praising God, I checked it out. In the Psalms, it is used like 17 times with singing. Sing praise. I found this verse. It's got it four times in there. 
Sing praise to God, sing praise. Sing praise to our King, sing praise. Wow. One of the ways we praise God is through our singing. Through our singing. And that's why it's so important to be here for our worship, part of our service that includes singing. We sing unto God. Listen, later Paul will write this in Ephesians. Speak to one another in psalms. <coughs> Excuse me. That's from, that's from the book of psalms in the Bible. You know, the largest book in the Bible is a song book, and it's got the songs in it. He says, speak to one another. Notice it says speak, because some of us are not very good singers. He says, speak unto, he says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns. That would have been the, the contemporary music of the day, um, in, in Paul's day. They, they would write new hymns that weren't in the, the Psalter, the psalms. And then spiritual songs. I don't know, maybe that would be like Christian rap. Oh, I know. So no way. It's a spiritual song. And then he says, now, first he says, speak it. Then he says, sing and make music in your heart. You know what that is? You can sing it, and if you don't quite know the words, hum it. Mm, do it in your heart. Mm, you just hum it. Hum it. Hum it in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks. Now, in the twin epistle, Colossians, it says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, in you richly. The word of Christ, that's the Bible, the word of God. You take the word from the teaching and the admonition of the word. You take the teaching that's going on. He says that you allow that to dwell in you richly. And then you teach and you admonish one another. You discuss the word of God with one another. With all wisdom, that is, you take what you've learned. Wisdom is applying what you know to life. He says you apply it to life, and as you sing, we teach you songs that hopefully some of them will catch, and you'll find yourself singing it all week long because it reinforces what the Bible is teaching. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude uh, in, in your hearts unto God. So here's the point that I'm trying to make. Greater worship involves making time for worship. It involves coming to a place of worship. It also involves celebrating the traditions of worship. It involves expanding your fellowship, fellowshipping to expand the worship experience, being sincere in your worship, Focusing on God in your worship and enjoying the very act of worship. Also singing in your worship. The result, when we do that, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily. Why? They met every day and they did that and it became contagious. People were so enthusiastically worshiping the Lord they were loving one another, so, and that love was just drawing more people in, drawing them in. They did not want to leave. They wanted to be a part of that group. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is, every day people were being saved. I would be delighted if every week somebody was being saved through our ministry. I would be delighted every day, every day. People were sharing their faith. They were expressing their faith. They were worshiping every day, and they were being saved every day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to be the Jesus-built church, built on the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, built upon his great commandment to love you with all of our hearts and love our neighbor as ourselves, and on the great commission to make disciples of all nations. Lord, we want to do that in such a way that we're worshiping you and people are drawn to us. They ask for the reason of hope and we share with them Jesus. They find salvation and they find in their worship the same experiences that we just read about here at Bethany. Lord, we're asking for greater things to be done in 2021 right here at Bethany. And Lord, if that's going to happen, it has to start with me and each person here. If we are counting on someone else to do it, it won't happen. Lord, I pray that you will do greater things through us as individuals 
so that collectively greater things will be done in 2021 through Bethany Church. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.